My name's Ian, and today's record is Frank Sinatra's Strangers in the Night. Today's album, Strangers in the Night, uh, number FS1017, recorded in 1966 and produced by Sonny Burke. Uh, this album here, I think I paid six bucks for it. It's one of, well, I was going to say one of my favorite, but I like everything that Sinatra did uh, previously, so, or after. Uh, just to show you that I'm not lying, uh, this stack here is all Sinatra. I can dig anywhere in there. Here, this is Sinatra. I can dig a little bit deeper. There you go. Here's the best of old blue eye. I've got, I think, 57 records. Uh, when I see one, I buy it. Uh, it's, I don't know, maybe it's a sickness. Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, today, like I said, is Strangers in the Night. Let me put it there. Uh, this one is an original. Uh, the sleeve is in good condition. Uh, better than fair, I would say good if I take it out. I do have the inner sleeve. It says a reprise record here with some artist on it. And on the other side here, also reprise record. Uh, the sleeve has a little crease in it, but most of them you don't have the sleeve. So there you go. If I take it out, uh, this album, this is side one here. Uh, maybe it's a little bit dirty. I've listened to it last week. Well, before this review, actually. Uh, it's near mint. If we look on the other side, there you go. Also mint. Well, near mint, not mint. Mint means, you know, perfect. This one is not exactly perfect, but it's almost there. So it was recorded and released in 1966. Uh, I think it was recorded at a Union Western Studio under the reprise label. That was Sinatra's label. Uh, I think he found it in uh, 1960 and he had to sell it in 63 because the company was venting money uh, at that time, right? He wanted more control. He left Capitol Records. He wanted more control and he, he wanted to do concept albums and uh, those cost money and they take time. So uh, it didn't go well for him. Uh, I think he had a streak of very bad luck uh, recording uh, some albums sold between like 40 and 50 60 thousand copies they're hard to find uh, this album won three Grammys one for a best male pop vocal performance uh, another one was record of the year and uh, the last one was the best arrange arrangement uh, this was Sinatra's first number one in 11 years also his last one um, after that Things were changing, right? Elvis was big and the uh, mamas and the papas and uh, the doors and uh, Vietnam War was happening. So uh, things began to change a little bit in the music on the radio. He was more mature. Uh, I think he sang with a purpose at that time. You know, the uh, the ears of him singing for uh, teenagers were, uh, were done, right? He's uh, like a, a different man now, more like a grown up. And uh, if you listen carefully, uh, all these songs have been, almost all of them have been done before, but uh, when, he, when he sings them, you feel like he has something to say and you're going to listen to it. In All or Nothing, uh, the conviction behind that performance uh, lets you know that he's not asking questions anymore. Uh, he's telling you how it is. Um, the confidence he had in there, uh, the way he swung that song, right? The song is just swinging and swinging and swinging. Uh, there's a lot of intensity behind it and uh, it makes for a good listening experience because uh, while he's doing it, you you can't be distracted. He won't let you be distracted, actually. I think he's grabbing you like this. He says, I'm talking now, sit down and listen. And uh, that's exactly what we're doing. We're listening. Right after that, there's another song called uh, Call Me. He, the first line of the song goes like this, right? If you're feeling sad and lonely, there's a service I can render. Uh, you believe every word he says when he says it. Uh, it's kind of sexy, but at the same time, it might be a little bit creepy, right? Times have changed, but if you put it into context of back then, right? He's just trying to be like a, I would say, yeah, maybe romantic, not romantic, more like sexy and uh, like, if you need somebody, I'm here for you, and you know who I am, and you know what I'm gonna do. So, <laughs> it's a, it's kind of a song of its time. But when you listen to it, you go like, yeah. As the song goes, the intensity and the groove of the band rises to a place that can't be denied. Uh, there's a build-up in that song where, uh, at the beginning, he's telling you what's going to happen, and in the middle, 
he's explaining to you how it's gonna happen and at the end of the song it's happening right it's like a uh, an intro for a movie a middle part and a third part and it's kind of a it's not graphic it's not explicit but you know what what's the meaning behind what he's saying actually he makes it very clear but it's just in polite words and polite terms the sound engineering in this album is on point right you can't get much better than that especially for uh, those years back then in this era uh, the arrangements are all there to complement sinatra's voice and the intent behind it uh, is tight it's clean it's expressive the brass section crushes when he's making a point in the song uh, the drums are used as a, an exclamation point uh, in the story to drive it further uh, the string section is milking Sinatra's voice to a place where you go like, well, that's undeniable, he's the man. In the song Downtown, he opens with, uh, when you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go downtown and you go like, yeah, right. Like, I'm not lonely, but when I was listening to this song, I was, I was thinking like, all right, let's go, let's go do something. Let's go downtown, let's go out tonight, let's have a cocktail. It's very engaging like this. He closes the album with uh, the most beautiful girl in the world and uh, that was a shot of speed to close an album, right? Usually albums, they, they start hard, then they go mellow, they come back and then they close with a ballad. Uh, that was, that's not a ballad. This is, this is something that, you know, when you're in, the, in a club having a cocktail, right? And uh, maybe you had a little bit much to drink and uh, then you, you're going down a little bit and that song comes up, right? Then you, you wake up again and then you're ready to attack another drink to get back down again after. Uh, Sinatra for me, right, has a special place. I'm not a, a historian of Sinatra. You know, I, I read biographies and stuff like that, but I won't bore you with his personal life. Uh, for me, it's the music. Uh, Sinatra is an optimist, right? Uh, these songs talk about love, talks about a relationship, uh, talks about heartbreak. Uh, it talks about things that come from an, on, an honest place. Um, he's, not a, he's not depressive. It's not like you, after listening to an album of Radiohead, you want to shoot yourself in the head. Uh, with Sinatra, you never want to shoot yourself in the head. Uh, even if you have dark days or whatever, you always think that there's a better tomorrow, there's a better later. and. Uh, I, many albums I have here in my stack, right? Like I've got box set, I've got compilations, I've got, I got pretty much everything. I, can't, I think I'm missing five albums, uh, US prints. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got Japanese prints in there. I've got prints from everywhere in there. Like I told you, it's a sickness when I see it. I just grab it, I buy it. I don't even look at the price. Uh, this one here, I paid six bucks, but uh, it would have asked 40 bucks and I would have still bought it. All right. So yeah, I'm, I think he's a little bit uh, known, people remember him, but as the uh, Rat Pack and stuff like that, but uh, I think behind the, uh, the persona of the Rat Pack, right, Rat Pack's a little bit at the end of his recording career, uh, maybe uh, on his uh, twilight years, and then he was doing appearances in Vegas, and uh, he, he's doing like TV shows and stuff like that, he was more coasting on his reputation of what he'd done before, and I think the uh, image of Sinatra that got stuck with people is Rat Pack, and like being the big guy in Vegas, but if you listen to, most of his songs are pre-Vegas, right? Most of his records are pre-Vegas, and uh, I think he should be remembered for something, uh, for the quality of his voice, the quality of singing, right? At uh, the beginning, his voice was good, but was not great, and as he got older, uh, his voice got better, the songs got better, the intent behind the song got better. I think he just became a better artist as he grew up. Uh, the problem is that he was a victim of his time, right? Uh, it's commonly known that he's not a big fan of Elvis even though they did a gig on TV together uh, he didn't like rock and roll he didn't like where music was going uh, he was more like political um, Democrat I think then he changed Republican long story short uh, I think that his essence a little bit got lost in the shake here in the in the shaker um, I think I think you should go back and look at the early records and you'll find you'll discover somebody that you didn't know existed because you only remember uh, the Vegas man. It's a little bit like Elvis. Everybody remembers uh, Elvis for Vegas. N nobody really remembers uh, Elvis, the young guy, Elvis, the uh, R&B singer, the gospel singer. We all remember the, uh, the pants and the jumpsuits and uh, the hand going around and, you know, the karate kicks, right? There's an artist behind that, Jailhouse Rock. Uh, great album but usually it's going to be vegas 76 or something like that so anyway that's that for today uh, i hope you enjoy this uh, leave a comment in the section catch you later